I think it was a, a really good success. We teamed with um, the Center of Iranian Studies from Tel Aviv University and a research center based in Berlin that does work on anti-Semitism and social policy. And we had about 150 people. There were scholars and sort of, I guess, political activists and journalists there, so it was a really great success. And then on a positive note, and I think it's important because we hear about all these depressing uh, things which are serious and they need to be analyzed and studied and made people, students need to be aware of. But at UNESCO there was an amazing event, I just wanted to tell you in a minute that I attended. It was a project and they just launched a website, it's called the Aladdin Foundation. And um, there were literally, there was about 3,000 people at UNESCO and it's people who are dedicated to teaching the Holocaust to the Muslim world. And um, there were diplomats, uh, prime ministers, presidents, uh, queens and kings and sheikhs. And, uh, it was really the who's who of many uh, Muslim countries and um, they've undertaken this in a very serious way. And uh, the president of Senegal gave a speech that uh, was, was tremendous, it was uh, it's even moving. And he said that Holocaust denial uh, and what's happening in the world in terms of ignorance and Holocaust denial is nothing short than a, world, a, a, a war against the Jews. And a war against the Jews is a war against humanity. And he was, it was amazing. And there were people, you know, diplomats from UNESCO, and there were people from uh, throughout Africa and Asia and the Middle East there. And uh, it was really something. So this, it's a, a project that you can get access to on the internet. And it is really uh, an impressive beginning to a project. The, the Shoah Foundation is working with other organizations that, governments from around the world. So there's, also, so there's good things happening too. So I wanted to let you know the good news. Um, so today, uh, we're very honored that uh, Farina Gunstadt has arrived today as, as our visitor. She's going to be speaking on, the title of her talk is Shifting, The Shifting Faces of Anti-Semitism in Turkey. Uh, Karina is a research fellow currently at the U.S. Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. She's a scholar, a translator, and a freelance, a freelance uh, translator from, of Turkish and French. Um, she's basically in the process of receiving her PhD from the University of Hamburg. She's expected to defend her thesis uh, next month in, in Hamburg. Um, she's, uh, she's engaged in Turkish studies, history, and the teachings of foreign languages there. Um, she's written on, she's written articles on issues of uh, anti-Semitism in Turkey. She wrote an article called The History of the Turkish Jew, Jews in Berlin from the 19, in the 1920s and 1930s and their faith during the Shoah. She's written an article about Turkey's role as a transit space for Jewish refugees to Palestine during World War II and, and the like. She's published various things. I know she was just at the University of Indiana and impressed uh, all of the scholars there very much. I've all sorts of wonderful things. So it's really an honor that you came here to share your work with us. So welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. thank you for the nice introduction. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you all for coming. And now I have to make this run, in a way. Can I make this move? Um, actually, my field has been in my book is on Turkey and the Holocaust, and anti-Semitism in Turkey is a new project, so um, it's more or less a work in progress, and when I'm finished, all kind of quick and remarks are very welcome. And it's that other, what I'm going to present has not been the topic of my PhD. My PhD is Turkey and the Holocaust. Okay. During the Gaza war, Sorry. What's happening here? During the Gaza war in January, Turkey witnessed an enormous eruption of anti-Semitism throughout the country. Slogans such as Hitler was right, Jews are the same in every country, bloody dogs get the hell out of our, of our country in Palestine were written on banners or shouted during public demonstrations um, in Turkey against Israel op operations in Gaza. Sorry, um, it's my second uh, presentation. Near Istanbul University, a group put a huge poster on the door of a shop owned by a Jew. 
do not shop here. This shop is owned by a Jew. The Osman Ghazi Cultural Federation in Eski Shehir, Eski Shehir is in the West, it's not a very Islamic town, placed a sign on the front door, no Jews or Armenians are allowed through this door. Dogs are free to enter. And if you know Islamic right, you know dogs are haram. So if people have a dog on their um, arms, it's even more insulting. The daily Anadolu Dabakid <coughs> repeated the urge the chief rabbinite of Turkey and the Turkish Jewish community to publicly condemn Israel, openly holding all the Jews responsible for what Israel does. A so far unknown group, Kavileyin, sent thousands of emails to Turkish Jews asking them to issue statesmen, statements condemning Israel's policy in Gaza and repay Ottoman tolerance by donating goods for the people in Gaza. Some businessmen also did that. So if a Jewish businessman had to get money from a partner, a Muslim partner, I hear some of these events, they say, okay, you get your out of a bill of $5,000, here I pay you 1000 and you get a receipt for a donation of $4,000 for Gaza. On the website of the local Istanbul radio station, Radio Denge, you could read, the Jews among us are much more dangerous than those outside. The rash of anti-Semitic events during the Gaza war led five leading American Jewish organizations to address a letter to Turkish Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan. Meanwhile, after critical reports in the international press, Erdogan declare, declared that he is not an anti-Semitic. President Abdullah Gül also made a public statement condemning anti-Semitism after public statements of some Turkish Jews that they felt very uneasy. With the end of the Gaza war, the mass actions and rallies against Israel came to an end, and the international public also lost, it, lost its interest. The outbreak of anti-Semitism during the Gaza war was not at all a specific Turkish phenomenon, neither a specifically Islamic one. We had similar rallies in all over Europe. So I would prefer not to focus on these events, but discuss the various phases of anti-Semitism in Turkey. First, anti-Semitism did not stop with the end of the war, although it disappeared from the headlines. Second, it is by no means a problem of marginal radical Islamist groups. Until February 5, um, this is, um, I, I took this from the internet, sorry. Uh, after Erdogan's and Gould's statements against anti-Semitism, the website of the Ankara branch of the AKP, which is the governing justice and development party, read an article defining Jews as a herd of grasshoppers, denying the Holocaust and claiming that some of Hitler's close friends were Jewish. The article was removed only after a journalist of the democratic newspaper Radikal, it's not a radical newspaper, it's just a name, it's, it's sometimes confusing, discovered it and contacted party officials. And finally, anti-Semitism is not a question of Islamists. A left demonstration also took place, and in the left liberal, or it's more progressive, uh, weekly, Yeni Aktuel, Salatin Yusuf claimed, referring to Adam Donald, after Gaza, it is not possible to write poems. And it is not a new phenomenon. Um, sorry. In November 2003, two Istanbul synagogues were bombed in a devastating attack that killed 57 people, mainly not Jews, mainly Muslim neighbors. This was actually the third attack after one in 86 and the second attack in March 92. Between the early 90s and today, several fatal attacks have also been carried out against known Jewish businessmen or members of the Turkish Jewish community. Anti-Semitic publications have a soaring sales figures in Turkey for years. 
the Turkish translation of Mein Kampf, in Turkish Kaugam, has been a bestseller for several years. And the Turkish edition of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, here you have, this is a picture I took at, book, at a uh, train station. And this is normal, you have at all the train stations or street corners, things like that. And here you have the protocols somewhere and these is um, of um, Harun Yahya, he has a so-called foundation. And it's his books do not have some anti-Semitism, they are really pure anti-Semitism. And here you have, you can buy the set, the Zionism set, six books for only 25. Thanks. Some were even shown as part of the official Turkish exhibit at the Frankfurt Book Fair in 2008, where Turkey was the official guest. A 2008 Pew Global Attitude Survey suggested that anti-Jewish sentiment in Turkey was rising. 76% of those surveyed say that they had negative views toward Jews. Three different views exist on anti-Semitism in Turkey. US media and some researchers in Israel consider anti-Semitism primarily or exclusively as a phenomenon of the Islamist forces in Turkey. The Turkish government and representatives of the Turkish Jewish community under the pressure of the government deny its very existence. Scholars of Oriental studies frequently emphasize that there was no religious-based hostility towards Jews under Islamic rule, for instance, during the Ottoman Empire, they consider anti-Semitism in the Near East exclusively as a reaction to the Israel-Palestine conflict and as an import from Christian Europe. All three of these explanations disregard the specific conditions of Turkish historic history and society. In fact, until today, little research has been done toward Turkish anti-Semitism. In Israel, Jacob Landau had published some articles during the 70s and in Turkey, of course, there is Rufat Bali, who has published several books. But main, most of them in Turkish, so they are not received in the Western world. What I'm going to present is more a work in progress than a finished result. So any remarks and criticism you have are very, very welcome. In the following, I will first give a short overview on the situation of Jews during different mm -hmm. periods of the Turkish Republic and the emergence of different forms and components of anti-Semitism due to the different historical situations. And then examine different ideological components and motives used by different forces that give the background of, of anti-Semitism. And finally, lay out responses to anti-Semitism in Turkey. I won't go back to the Ottoman Empire. I just want to emphasize that the Islamic-based Islamic Ottoman rule did not know religious hatred towards Jews. Christian and Jews were both tolerated as so-called dhimis at the condition that they accepted the superiority of Islam. Both were subjected to the same restrictions and discriminations. However, Christian anti-Judaism was quite widespread and increased during the 19th century among the empire's Christian population and among European Christians, like the Damascus affair, I guess you know this blood libel, and infected sometimes also the Muslim population. The threat from the Christians towards Jews in the Ottoman Empire facilitated a rapprochement between the Jewish minority and the Ottoman or later Young Turk leadership, and led to the Jews becoming sometimes of a something of a token minority. Is that a saying in English? to present, look how good their situation is. However, elements, elements of modern European anti-Semitism were at, at a time translated into Ottoman Turkish. For instance, in 1880, by one of the most important publishers on this period, Tefik Ebuzia. The Turkish Republic was founded on the ruins of the multi-ethnic Ottoman Empire. The declared aim was the Turkification of the economy, society, and the population. 
Although the vast majority of the Jews was, were poor, the nationalist propaganda labeled Jews as exploiters, profiteers. Restrictions against the minorities, for instance, job restrictions in order to drive them out of the economic sphere, were presented as the continuation of the war, war of liberation. And that's something that goes on until today in left-wing or anti-imperialist publications presenting the minorities as the um, representatives of the imperialist forces. And the Kemalist ideology accused minorities, all of them, of being agencies of the imperialist powers that had destroyed the Ottoman Empire. Although these policies were not specifically anti-Semitic and had effect other non-Muslim and non-Turkish minorities as well, Jews were frequently targets of public vilifications. Repeatedly, public pressure by politicians or the media forced the Jew Jewish community to make donations, for example, for the Turkish Air Force, in order to prove its loyalty. And so what happened currently, the blackmail against the Jewish community was actually a pattern we had in the beginning in the Kemalist period. It is noteworthy that the ideology the Kemalist elite applied to assert the Turkish nation state was ambivalent. On the one hand, everybody living in Turkey was formally given equal rights and called a Turk. Subsequently, it was forbidden for people to claim any other ethnicity. On the other hand, the state maintained the distinction between minorities and Turks, referred to as true Turks. So for a job, you had to be a true Turk. And Islam, on the other hand, was kept as one of the main markers to distinguish the true Turks from mm -hmm. the other. So in a way, the Turkish Republic, the secular Turkish Republic, inherited the Ottoman distinction between Muslims and Gaidi Muslims. Oh, Gaidi is it? During the 30s, we can observe a radicalization of nationalist politics that at the time took on racist traits. In order to achieve the Turkification of the population, the government encouraged the immigration of hundreds of thousands of Muslims to Turkey. The settlement law empowered the government to dislocate the population of whole regions. This was mainly used against the Kurds, but affected the Jews also. An amendment to this law empowered, allowed the government to strip people of Turkish citizenship if they were regarded as culturally not Turks. So this is, for example, a decision I found in the archive in Ankara, stripping Jews, Jewish family in Erzurum from citizenship for bad ambitions and bad manners. This was not very frequent, but it showed the spirit of the time. This policy had harsh consequences for Jews. First, the displacement of the Jews from Turkish Thrace, in, which is the European part of Turkey, <coughs> border to Bulgaria and Greece, in the summer of 1934, a region that had had a significant Jewish population for centuries and was kind of part of the heart of the Sephardic Jewry. Mm. Second, the policy to prevent the transit of Jewish refugees from Europe, Europe after 1938 and during the Holocaust and the reluctance of Turkey to allow Turkish Jews living in Europe to return to Turkey during these years. There were some 200 German Jewish refugees in Turkey, and this is always very well known because they were so outstanding scholars, but Jews as a whole was rega were regarded as an unwanted element, and there were laws <coughs> prohibiting Jews to enter Turkey or to um, refuge through Turkey. It was during these years that classics of so-called modern anti-Semitic literature, the protocols of the elders of Zion, as well as writings by Adolf Hitler, Theodor Fritsch, Henry Ford, were translated into Turkish. Some of the publications bankrolled by Germany. 
1934, Jevad Rafat Atilhan published a newspaper called Mili in Pia, on the right side, uh, National Revolution, after having spent several months in Nuremberg as a guest of Julius Streicher, publisher of the Stürmer. Atilhan <coughs> had received financial aid of the German Nazis and used the same cartoons. So here you have another, and you can see for, it's, for instance, here you have a church which is turned in the mosque and a woman is wailed, but it's the same cartoon. Attila was a veteran of World War I and the so-called War of Liberation and had already published some anti-Semitic papers during the 20s. So he was not only influenced by Germany, he was an anti-Semite already before and then got help and ideologic ideas from Germany. During World War I, he was stationed in Palestine and was involved in the oppression of the Nili group. I think you know what's a Nili group? It was a small spy group, yeah, of course you know. <laughs> Aaron Aronson. <laughs> was, actually, there were some youngsters from the first Aliyah from Romania in Palestine. And Aaron Aronson was a very um, beautiful Agronome, he found the wild emmer. So he became famous on a world scale. He came to the United States, was invited, whatever. And during World War I, Kemal Pasha, Jemal Pasha, who was the, um, of the commandant in chief for the Turkish or Ottoman army in the Arab lands, started to deport or dislocate the Jews of Palestine. And the Nili group was a small group of actually two families, the kids of two families, spied for the British. And this, and Sarah Adamson was tortured to death, and or she killed herself, but she was um, very hard to torture. And um, the first books of Atil Han uh, covers, he published early in the 30s, uh, cover the alleged Jewish betrayal the hero or the anti-hero is Sarah Aronson of his book. And Jews in Palestine are characterized as a snake that we, the Turks, nourished at our breast and who betray us. So I think it's important to notice that the Palestine question was one of the earliest topics of hatred against Jews. Primarily not religiously motivated, but nationalist. They betray us and so Palestine uh, went to the Jews and the Arabs. In today's publications on Palestine, this is still a very important topic. That's something different from the Arab countries. It's especially we, the Ottoman, own these lands and they betrayed us. Beside Atilhan, who was to become a founding figure of Islamist anti-Semitism in Turkey, extreme nationalists like Nihal Atsis were also attracted by German Nazi ideas and anti-Semitism, and he became a founding member of the fascists in Turkey. However, Atalan's paper, Mili Istiklal, was forbidden by the government, but the military reprinted his anti-Semitic novel and distributed 40,000 copies to military units. So the stand of the government during this time was already very ambiguous. Although Atalan and Atsis can be considered both as extremists and were publicly criticized by several Turkish intellectuals at the time, anti-Semitic stereotypes and the same kind of cartoons found their way into mainstream publications. There's an interesting work of a colleague of mine comparing anti-Semitic cartoons in, or Jews in, in cartoons in Turkey. And prior to 33, there were cartoons against everybody, but after 33, they took this style of the German anti-Semitic um, paintings or drawings, sorry. For Jews, the years 33 to 45 constituted the dark, for Turkish Jews, sorry, constituted the darkest period of their history. Beside the above mentioned expulsion of Jews from trace, the so-called wealth tax, an extraordinary tax that was used to strip Jews and Christians of their property and assets. Those 
incapable of raising the arbitrarily set and often astronomical amounts had their property auctioned off. And these auctions were very often public amusements. So now we get the assets of the Jews. 1,200 people, both Jews and Christians, were sent to forced labor camps in Eastern Anatolia for their incapability to pay the tax. And in these auctions, really, people were everything taken out, taken out of their houses. So some Jews who arrived as refugees from Europe, to some Jewish Jews who could make their way back, they found their relatives living without furniture. These measures, of course, were not at all comparable to the persecution of Jews in Germany or in German affiliated countries. But the humiliating climate and the expropriation led to the immigration of about half of the Jews from Turkey in 47-48. The immigration of these Jews again was accompanied by a hostile campaign accusing the Jews for lack of patriotism. After 46, in the aftermath of World War II, or more, more precisely in the course of the Cold War, Turkey became a partner of the Western Alliance, of the NATO, and an associate of the European community. Introduced multiple party system and free market. In terms of our topic, the following events of this peri period are noteworthy. First, the emergence of radical, small, fascist, and Islamist parties. They were set predecessors sorry, of what were to become mass movements during the 70s. Both of the above-mentioned anti-Semites, Atilhan and Atsis, both who were connected to Germany, were founding members of these parties. The Büyük Doğu Cemiyeti, uh, the Association of the Greater East, established by the poet Nejib Fazıl Kısakürek, won enormous influence. And Nejib Kısıl, um, Fazıl Kısakürek, today is still, you can take his books wherever, and it's very, um, um, he's very, had a good, has good reputation among uh, conservative people. The so-called events of 6th and 7th September 1955 are not linked to Jews, but after government circles spread the rumor that the house in Thessaloniki, where Ataturk was born, had been destroyed by Greek terrorists, riots against the Christian minority broke out. The mob assaulted Istanbul's Greek community, plundered its houses and shops, and injured and killed several of them. The background of these riots was the tension between Turkey and Greece over Cyprus. The Greek commun community in Istanbul was the main target of these incidents, but other Christians, Armenians, and to a lesser extent Jews, were also affected. The pattern of this pogrom is basically the same as the pressure on the Jewish community during the Gaza War. Minorities living in Turkey, and citizens of Turkey, of course, are considered responsible for what their alleged external government does, and thus become hostages. In 1952, we have a, a murder attempt against Ahmed Emin Yalman, who was a secular journalist who took a stand against the extreme right Islamist circles. And he became a public target, mainly by this poet, Nejib Fazıl Kısakure. <coughs> He, um, the campaign, used Yalman's origin of a Denme family to denounce him as a Jew. Denme in Turkish <coughs> means uh, somebody who converts, but it's more used in the sense of we have two words. Ichtida is the Arab word, and it's more used if somebody converts to another religion. Denme mainly is used against the followers of Sabatai Tui in Saloniki or other places of Turkey. And, um, Today, this is the main topic, I will come back to that, but it's already in 52. And a lot of people who were from Denver families, or who were alleged to be from Denver families, played a, an important role in the <coughs> press and intellectual life, in, in secular press in Turkey since the beginning of the Republic. So they always, this Denver always became a target 
uh, identifying Jews with progressive intellectuals, Jews running the press. And um, this book is the memoirs of the perpetrator. Yalman survived this attempt, and the perpetrator, uh, Hussein Uzmez, spent several years in prison, then came out, and until last year, he was a very accepted uh, journalist in Turkey. He went to jail last year again for um, abusing a 13-year-old girl. And during the trial, and nobody talked about that he was, uh, this thing was already forgotten. And I read his, or I didn't read it, I looked into his memories, and he describes the murder attempt, because it's interesting, that gives the thought of these Islamist right-wing people. He writes, 30 million Muslims against one Denmark did not intimidate Yalman, the journalist. Yalman had studied in Columbia University and had America behind him. We felt so inferior and that enraged us and made us furious. So I think this is one of the motivations on this side. The above mentioned Jevad Rifat Atilhan published during 50s and 60s a large number of horrent anti-Semitic books. The main topic of his book, Yer Yuzunun Hakiki Janile, Yani Jews, the main, um, the true murderers on Earth, appeared in 62, and the main topic is a kind of Holocaust denial. He says, actually, the Jews are responsible for uh, the World War and for all the murdering. That's interesting because at that time, Holocaust denial was not a topic internationally. And I just found this book, it's normally not mentioned. Atilhan, until last year, was on the um, homepage of the Turkish Minister for Culture and Tourism, among all other writers. Now they put up this homepage, but not only him. They actually, I think they reconstruct their homepage. But he was shown or presented as one of Turkish uh, authors to read. And this book was not mentioned. I just found it accidentally in the Library of Congress. And I was really shocked by the fact that it, the main topic is Holocaust United in time when it was not um, a topic. I have to may, so there's, there are two possibilities. Either he was in contact with German Nazis at that time, I think. Or maybe he fought in the 48th war against um, Israel. There were some volunteers from Turkey who went there. Uh, during the 60s and 70s, Turkish society experienced an enormous social upheaval. Millions of people migrated from the rural areas into the big cities, and we see a sharp political radicalization on both sides. The emergence of an Islamist party under the leader Nizamettin Erbakan. Erbakan, Nizamettin Erbakan, had studied mechanical engineering and made his PhD in Germany during the 50s. This has not been really a topic of research. So I don't know, but I think it's interesting that at the same time, members of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood also studied, studied in Germany. Or maybe he only met anti-Semitic people in Germany. But because when he came back, he was an ardent anti-Semit and um, became one of the main figures in Turkish anti-Semitism and Islamist movement. In 69, he first entered the Turkish parliament as an independent candidate from Konya, which is an Islamist stronghold in the center of Anatolia. At this time, he already declared communism and Zionism as the main dangers for Turkey. During the 70s, his party grew to a mass movement. Zionists and Freemasons were not allowed to become members. In his book, Mini Gürsch, The National Group, View of, of 75, he declared the European Union to be a Zionist entry in order to make Turkey a colony of Israel. The rhetoric of Erbakan during these years has many similarities to that of the Muslim Brotherhood. I quote, those who know Zionism compare it to an octopus. This octopus has new numberless arms. Communism is one arm, capitalism is another arm, 
Freemasonry is a state branch, and racism another. So all evils on the world are actually an emergence of Zionism. Um, we find in his ideology a copy and melange of all kinds of anti-Semitism, but as far as I read so far, not based on Islamic religion. However, there are references to negative mentions of Jews in Quran, for, for, for instance, in the writing of Atro Duzda. At the same time, the fascist MHP, Milici Harakit Partisi, under al Paslan Turkish, who was together with Nihat Aziz, the two branches I mentioned prior, um, also emerged as a mass movement. Both parties, Islamists and fascists, and their several mass organizations and paramilitary organizations had more than 100,000 members. Despite ideological differences, both parties used Islam and nationalism. So the fascist party has a Islamiet Ruhumus Türklük Bidenimis, our soul is Islam, our body is Turkish. And the Islamists also use Turkishness. So of course, there was always, and until today, there is a struggle um, on power between them, and there are ideological differences, but both are ardent anti-communist and anti-Semitic and anti-Western. The violence at the edge of the Civil War during the 70s, maybe there were hundreds and thousands of, uh, thousands of killings of democratic people, either people in the trade unions or uh, writers or whatever. And so I get this is one of the reasons why the impact of anti-Semitism during this period never attracted much international attention. But it is safe to say that anti-Semitic ideas during this period already had an enormous impact. It found also its way into scholarly work. Ikme Tanyu was a professor at the Ilayet faculty, see, the Faculty for Religious Sciences, and published two enormous volumes, each of his 800 pages, under the title Tarich Bonja Yahudi Levi Türkle, Jews and Turks Throughout History. And his books contain classic stereotypes of modern antisemitism. Theodor Fritsch is one of his sources, but he's recognized on Wikipedia, Wikipedia the English version I just read that his book is considered as the first serious approach to the Jewish history in Turkey. So I give this example not to um, say Wikipedia is, is nonsense, but this topic has never, never been researched. And it's so boring to read all this stuff. But it's millions and millions of publications during the 70s and 80s when the Turkish writing parties was an ally of the United States. So that nobody cared about that. On the other hand, the late 60s and 70s brought with it the development of a radical left that split during the 70s into several strains and groups, but rose to a mass movement. Although these movements would never consider themselves as anti-Semitic and use the vocabulary to condemn racism, Israel, like in the worldwide left movement, was considered not only as an oppressor of the Palestinian people, but in the same times as a region, regional representative of the US. One of the first militant actions of the THKPG was the kidnapping of the Consulate General of Israel, Ephraim Elrom, in May 1971 in Ankara, two months after the military putsch in March 71, in order to achieve the liberation of political prisoners. And as far as I know, until today, this action was never a point of critical reflection in Turkish life. The 1980s, above all marked by the military putsch of 12 September, brought several important changes. It was followed by a period of strong political repression. Almost the whole generation of students and young intellectuals was affected either went to prison or to exile, and all kind of books, including much of world classic literature, was banned, thus weakening the democratic and progressive intellectual circles. 
Second, the assumption that the NATO and mainly the US security forces support the Turkish military and so-called special forces enforced the already existing anti-Americanism and all kind of conspiracy theory. So among Turkish left wing, it's like in Latin America. They went through all these tortures so and they know or think or whatever United States is guilty. The Islamic movement grew to two fact factors. First, the military government spread Islamic propaganda all over the country. This Islamization from above pushed for the Turkish Islamic synthesis, an amalgamation of Turkish nationalist and Islamic ideologies. It's, so for example, in universities, uh, Islamic ideology became mandatory. It was, this was again the secular army. On the other hand, the worldwide rush of the Islamic movement due to the emergence of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Another factor is important for the discussion in Turkey. An indirect consequence of the putsch of 1980 was the blending of the existing political fronts in Turkey. The coup and its aftermath led to a fundamental questioning of Kemalism by Turkish for progressive intellectuals who so far had subscribed to the idea of Kemalism, now undertook a new evaluation of history. The fact that Islami and left-wing intellectuals considered themselves both as a victim of the Kemalist military led to new platforms and alliances. The fight against censorship united them, and so some progressive intellectuals, for example, uh, Shana Yurda Tapan printed a book of the anti-Semitic Dilipan. It was not, the book was not anti-Semitic, but he made him a person, a respectable person, and Dilipak is one of the worst anti-Semites. But what I want to say is everything went bottom up, or how do you say that thing? <laughs> Over the course of the 90s, the Kurdish uprising which had developed already in the 70s, became a mass movement. The violence during these years marked the whole society and led to a growth of Turkish nationalist mobilizations until lynchings we had in the last years. And um, the involvement of state and military agencies in a series of extra-legal operations and its collaboration with Islamist and fascist underground organizations enforced the growth of conspiracy theories all along. More than 15,000 homicides are perpetrated by unknown people, and often by people linked to the state forces. So there are hundreds of books on these conspiracies, and people try to find out. Of course, conspiracy theories are widespread among all groups. Islamists, nationalists, Turkish, Kurdish, and leftists are extremely receptive to conspiracy theories, and from this kind of reductionist worldview, it is only a short path to anti-Semitism, since everybody knows who runs America. So the Kurdish, the president of the Kurdish pan, when Germany took a um, decision to forbid PKK, the president of the Kurdish pan, Haider Ishik, said, yes, but we know, Clinton and Fisher, we know they are all Jews. So when they become a target, of course, in the spirit of these people, everybody is a Jew. What is particularly remarkable in this context, that antagonist political forces accuse one another of being backed by or being puppets of the Jews. Alleged Kurdish Jewish conspiracies rank very high in the list of popular conspiracy theories. When Iraq's transitional constitution, which granted expelled Iraqis, including Iraq's Jews, the right to return came to into effect in 2004, Islamist and national circles in Turkey suspected a Kurdish Jewish conspiracy aimed to taking over Iraq. Hürriyet, the mass paper, led with the news that the Barzani, one of the main parties in Iraq Kurdistan, were Jews. Numerous books on this topic appeared. 
Both nationalists and Islamists harbor the belief that the Turkish government's South Anatolia project, which is a huge development project with 20 of barrages, and um, is in reality a Jewish scheme to subjugate the entire Middle East from the Nile to the Euphrates. A proof, as a proof, they point to a passage in Genesis in which God promised Abraham's descendants the land from the Nile to the Euphrates. But this is very widespread belief in Turkey. On the other hand, the Kurdish movement, for their part, held supposed Jewish responsible for Turkey's repressive policy towards the Kurds. In the mid-90s, after the military alliance between Turkey and Israel, publications sympathetic to the PKK published a number of incendiary anti-Jewish articles. And, okay, I will try to... So this is Mahir Kainaf taught, as he's a professor, he taught economics for many years, first at Istanbul University, and served for 10 years as an official officer in the Turkish intelligence agency MIT, Milli Istigratis Pilatet. He writes as a columnist for the centrist mainstream Turkish daily Star Gazette. So he's not an extremist, or he is what he is, not viewed as one. Because of his background as an intelligence officer for a long time, he became an often interviewed expert on the counterinsurgency operations. This is from an interview with Neshe Duzen for the center-left liberal radical, where he states that there is no Al-Qaeda, it's a code name for CIA operations. One of the most popular themes is that Turk, Turkey allegedly being controlled by the Denma. The Denma is what I explained um, prior, the descendants of Sabatai trees. Those who were converted, there were three branches. And these books both sold some hundred thousand copies. Um, the descendants of the Dönme, who since the beginning of the Turkish Republic have been strongly re represented among committed journalists and left-wing intellectuals, are to this day being denounced and attacked as crypto-Jews. Also, the Republic founder Atatürk, whose birthplace Saloniki was an important Denmark center, has been denounced in countless publications as a puppet of Freemasons and Jews. And these, I, I won't explain the books, but it's, both of them are well known, are, and it's like a sport to out hidden Jews, and there's a huge discussion how much Jewish blood is in which family. It's really like, it's not like a sport, it's like a nightmare. The anti-Semitism against the Denme combines a bunch of components of anti-Semitism. First, Jews are the hidden enemy, the hidden enemy among us. Jews are the intellectuals. A lot of journalists are referred to as to be Denme. And traitors. Denme and Jews are said to have been behind the Young Turks, responsible for the fall of the Ottoman Empire a statement often made in connection with the claim that Atatürk himself had been a dead man. The allegation that the Young Turks, the group who made the revolution in 1908, came from Salonika, were actual, actually de Jews or dead men, makes also Kurds and Armenians, who consider themselves as victims of the Young Turks or of Turkish nationalism, very vulnerable for, vulnerable, sorry, for this specific kind of anti-Semitism. And the last one, sorry, <laughs> is Jews as guests. Whenever Turkish politicians are asked about anti-Semitism in Turkey, they always, the only, almost stereotyped answer is, we, the Turks, have always been tolerant. We opened our doors for the Jews. Erdogan said, Tayyip Erdogan, the prime minister, said to Paris in Davos, my grandfather welcomed your grandfather. And he stated that repeatedly towards representatives of the Jewish community, and he was not the first. These books are the memories of um, Benson Pinto, who for about 30 years has been the president of the Jewish community in Turkey. And the last 30 pages are letters of 
Turkish politicians, and most they have this kind of statement, yes, we welcome you, so we like you. And unfortunately, the Turkish, or parts of the Turkish Jewish community in the 500 Years Foundation also promote this kind of gratitude because we are the guests. In fact, this discourse makes the Jews tolerated guests who enjoy their host society's hospitality and is expected to be appropriately grateful and loyal in return. This, on the other hand, puts the Jews in the position of hostages who are always under pressure to prove their loyalty. When in last year the American Congress was about to vote a declaration on the Armenian genocide, Turkish Foreign Minister Babajan said, if America is going to vote to, to make such a declaration, I can't guarantee for the security of the Jews in Turkey. So they are always used as kind of hostages. And I see I have run out of time. Um, actually, I have uh, two more topics, the different strains of anti-Semitism and the responses, but we can leave that for the question part. Sure. Okay. Sorry for using so much time. Thank you. How do you drive your presentation with the relationship between Turkey and Israel? I mean, they have had quite a lot of common activities, trade, mm -hmm. <coughs> military cooperation, water supply, and the like thing of Israel. Yeah, the water that Israeli um, business is engaged in this. Um, Anadolu project um, is used by this conspiracy That's theory. The Abraham story. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now they are taking. But I meant to, I thought Turkey had promised to provide Israel with water. Yes, but uh, this is the water from part, the Euphrates. I see. It's part of that deal. Yeah, it's no, it's part also a part of this ideology because it's it's water of the Euphrates. Uh, I don't know how you how you pronounce it, Euphrates. Yeah. Euphrates. 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 Oh, sorry, Euphrates, yeah. <coughs> so it's it's a Euphrates who goes to the Kurdish uh, regions of Turkey. But uh, mainly the military alliance and the economic alliance um, has an interesting effect because even the most hardcore Islamists, if they come to power, when Erbakan, the most ardent anti Semitic of Turkey, was on, in power, he signed the, the military alliance with Turkey. So this is funny, and then they know, as a person who is a prime minister, I have to restrain from open anti-Semitism. But um, of course, on the bottom of the party, you have still the same thoughts. But when Erdogan came to power, the party split, Tayyip Erdogan, who is now the <coughs> Prime Minister. Until 2000, the Islamist party of Turkey split, and the fascist party also split. So in both parties, we have one wing that is openly anti-Semitic, and the other who are the those who are in the government, the fascist party also had been in the government, they um, at least don't hear this in the open uh, campaign. What's the answer? The more, the more the, the, the pragmatic. Yeah, it's actually it's real politics. But I'm not somebody who, who is going to think, oh, what, what may be his hidden thoughts in the official uh, rhetoric of Erdogan and of the MHP today, <coughs> they restrain from this kind of politics. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, you raise the problem that actually the UN itself has had to cope with, because a lot of this activity is not state precipitated or state sponsored. It comes from other groups within the so-called civil society who become powerful enough and sometimes are in the state. Mm -hmm. But it's very hard to distinguish what is from the state and what is not. And when one misses the distinction between uh, the Durban Conference, in which it was the NGOs who expressed so many of those things that you have shown so strongly, 
by the United Nations Peace that evicted people from the compound. It would suggest that one has to think very carefully of who one attacks and who doesn't and what you do about strengthening and protecting the moderate elements in states who also wish to oppose fascism. And I was curious if you uh, had what kinds of solutions you can see, if any, to this, you know, the things you couldn't talk about, the responses to it, et cetera. So if I, I'm going to take the liberty to piggyback the question up to your question. I, I just heard Bernard Lewis speak a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he was saying that basically that he's, he's sort of writing off the Turkish uh, state, the bureaucracy, mm -hmm. um, that is being sort of infiltrated by radical Islam, mm -hmm. and that he sort of wrote it off, wrote it off to a large extent, and, and as well as the, oh. the Bernard Lewis. Ah, Bernard Lewis. Yeah, um, and he's basically he pinned his hopes on the military. No. <laughs> yeah. so, so, <laughs> I know that's the position so of given, United States and Bernard Lewis. Yeah, so given so given what you said about the history of the military. Right? Yeah. What hope is there? If it's true that radical Islam is infiltrating the bureaucracy in the state, and the only hope, according to some, is the, is the military, but the history of the military is so checkered, how do you see, what, what's the projection of Turkey? Maybe I can ask one more phrase to that. <laughs> Would you say that uh, the character of the Turkish anti-Semitism is more driven by Islamic thought, or is it more affected by Western ideas? What is the major driving force? So I think there's, there's two questions. Maybe if you focus on <laughs> at least, focus, can you focus so like on the state? Oh, it uh -huh. went off. Because I have one here with, with different strength. I would like, actually, <laughs> I hope it works. Because I ran out of battery. Um, <laughs> so these are the different motives and you find them among a lot of different today the basis of people who ran the rallies is mainly voters of the right wing Islamist parties we don't we mustn't confound or mingle up the AKP has large voters among liberal urban population. This is a common prejudice, is that a word? Prejudice? Prejudice. Prejudice, sorry. <laughs> In United States, or the, the far you go, everybody thinks, yes, the Islamists. And the voters of AKP are not all blind Islamists. That's not my point of view. Um, the, se the problem is that you have a very false front. You have seen these huge manifestations when the military tried to forbid the AKP. And a lot of liberal persons supported the AKP and see what's that? We have had putsches in this state for 30 years. And if a party is voted by the population, we have to accept it. And it's true that the AKP, in a lot of points, made lot, much more progress. For example, during the prior nationalist government, it wouldn't have been possible to discuss openly the Armenian topic. And there is still a lot of pressure. I, I don't, I'm not, I, I'm not a fan of Erdogan's policy, but mainly it's also nationalist. So you have this wrong front, and the liberal or progressive intellectuals are divided into two camps, into two wrong camps. One are quite blind towards the danger of Islamism. I show this example. It's, it's a person who's in um, good contact with human rights organizations, and as a protest against um, censorship, he rep reprints with a group of intellectuals forbidden books. And he reprinted one book of this ardent anti Semitic. I think he didn't even read it, but this is not an excuse. On the other hand, and most of the Jewish community, or at least this, 
spokesmen of spokespeople of the Jewish community support the Kemalists, but going uh, this is a mixture of fascist, Kemalists, and ardent nationalists. So um, I don't know whether this is a very good choice. And you have what is very widespread among Islamists is the, the European uh, modern anti-Semitism, the protocols and things like that. But it's very seldom based on, for example, Quranic verses. You have some of the mixture of that. Even um, the party who is more Islamist than Erdogan, the Saudi party see, what they, their main position is we have the Ottoman heritage to defend it. When, that, when Erdogan came back from Davos, I have a photograph on that, um, he was referred to as a hero, as a national hero, and as the new leader of the world. There were no Islamist um, slogans. It was mainly his, um, the history is written by the brave leaders. And he said, this is an interesting flag. Look at those flags. Yeah. This is a, yeah. wow, I Palestine, Turkey, flag. Yeah, but yeah. that has a reason, because it's from, the, the AKP fears to, need to be forbidden again. Mm -hmm. So Abdullah Gül gave the order not to take uh, green flags, if you want to take Palestinian yes. flags. So, but it's, there is nothing of, um, Hamas or whatever, you have Hamas friendly demonstration, but the main topic is we have been the masters of the Ottoman Empire, we have been, and for example, the. Um, there was a, there was a, in the where is this located, sir? This is in Istanbul when Erdogan came back from, from Davos. Okay. He was the national hero. But he was not so much a national hero because for anti Semitism, but for um, paying back to the West. And that's a very important um, motive in Turkish anti-Semitism, the um, betrayal. Oh no, that's not the right one. But I, I don't want to lose the time. Also, the kafir was made into a Turkish symbol. The previous picture. Yeah. What? The kafir. The Palestinian sure. kafir was made into a Turkish kafir. Yes, but what I wanted to say is one of. Um, one of my main topics, actually, is not to... I could find hundreds of radical, radical anti-Semitic quotes in the press every day. But what I actually try to do is to find the codes, the hidden anti-Semitism, among the, the main majority of the population. To give you an example, I talked with two secular Turkish journalists here in New York and Washington, who would consider themselves as very progressive. One told me, yes, you're right. I hate these anti -Semites. I love the Jews. I went to college with Jews. They were so wonderful and so clever. That's no, that explains why the Jews run America. <laughs> <laughs> and the second one said, yeah, but that is, that is a mainstream. So we don't talk about, you have this fascist Islamist which are very strong, but I think my problem is how to get the people who, are, who make the mainstream. If you criticize anti-Semitism, the mainstream press will regard you as somebody who blames Turkey. So even if they don't spread anti-Semitism themselves, they are still nationalists, everything that's criticized Turkey is considers, considered as blaming Turkey. And the second person I met in is he's also a journalist and also very progressive. And he said, let's make a book on anti-Semitism. He has no idea about it. But he said, let's make a book. You are in contact, in contact with these Jews. They will pay for it. So <laughs> it's so, you know, and that is mainstream. You find that very in every corner. How will you deal? And, this, and another point is, for example, uh, Holocaust denial. Holocaust denial, you have the hardcore Holocaust denial. But on the other hand, you have people who don't deny it, but who just have no idea about it. There is one book 
of Primo Levi, which is translated into Turkish. And I think Yehuda Bauer appeared in a small, not very well-known um, publishing house. Norman Finkelstein, he was translated within two months. And so people really don't know what they say. It's very frequent just to vulgarize the Holocaust. When I went to the Kurdish regions, it, and I met with people from the human rights organizations, it was frequently to say, oh, what the Turkish state does to us, it's much harder what, than what Hitler does to the, did to the Jews. But this is more merely a point of really being dumb and unconscious. And also, the Turkish state, yeah. come to my topic, <laughs> accuses the Holocaust, the myth, we save the Jews for their foreign politics topics. So they promote, this is alleged, he, he says to have saved 20,000 Jews, which is just invented story. But in Turkish dis discussion of Holocaust, the only topic is the heroic involvement of Turkish diplomats, which very often is just invented stories. The Jews, even the Turkish Jews, doesn't even appear. And this is also a kind of, it's not denial, it's, it's blaming the Jews and unconsciousness. So it's, it has so different um, layers. And I think the main problem among the majority of the population is really unconsciousness. you presented, they, uh, let's say that seems very consistent in a way or another, but uh, they seem to me that they ask for a serious or dedicated reader. And uh, when it is a radical uh, political culture, and uh, as we talked about the rural masses who, are, who, who, are, uh, who became uh, urban, mm -hmm. um, a sign of this radicalization are the brochure, the little, the little books, the posters, the caricatures, the, all of this uh, very incisive and uh, very accessible uh, uh, information. And uh, do, do, do you, did you meet on the street or on these public squares where uh, they are very easy, easily to be spread uh, this kind of literature, which are not so serious books, yeah, but very little books or very, you know what I mean? Very they, first of all, they are not little. They are not. They are big fans. Yeah, that's what she says. She's asking, no, but I think. Did you see pamphlets being an answer to that? Yeah, another kind of. There is a, also another kind of literature. I'm not serious literature, you say. Uh, it's not a literature. It is another way of expressing radicalism. Propaganda. It is a small yes. 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 propaganda. Brochure, yeah. little books, who, which do uh, not ask for a serious reader. They ask for, they just, just uh, give the incisive, uh, radical, uh, impressive, and uh, very shorthand information. And uh, anti Semitism, it's uh, very well spread in this kind of way. Or, for example, in public uh, spaces or in campuses, you can see posters or uh, this uh, brochure, not uh, serious books. Mm -hmm. One very, um, first of all, you have television, this kind of very hardcore films from. Sarah's Blue Eyes. I don't know whether you knew this film. It's, it's an Iranian production, blaming Israel for getting children to murder them and then take their eyes. Mm -hmm. That have been shown in Turkey, and you have a very national series, Kurda Vadisi, the Valley of the Wolves, which is mm -hmm. mainly nationalist, but also anti-Semitic, and brochures. I, for example, in the 90s, it's now 10 years ago or 12 years, in the 1905 um, electoral campaign, the Erbakan I mentioned very often, who was the leader of the Islamist um, anti Semitism, he uh, diffused a propaganda brochure Who Runs the World Jews. I didn't see leaflets, but I. I'm not so frequently in Turkey, and I go, it depends on which area you need to go. But you have it in, in press, you have it in the normal press, and you have it, I didn't, I dropped that in the internet, of course. If you, just make a try, give in the word Yahudi, and you will have a million hits, and 90% is anti Semitic. Also, as of last year, Turkey, there are 12 publishing houses publishing the protocols yeah. of the Elders of Zion in Turkey. No, uh, Mein Kampf. 
It could be my cough as well, but definitely the protocol. Yeah, I was wondering about various things, but just um, about what you said about Erbakan's uh, book, I think 1975, Miligurush. Yeah. I was wondering when you said he uh, used this image of uh, the, the Zionism as octopus. And yeah. Um, and you mentioned various arms, yeah. and I wondered about the racism, because you said that he uh, definitely used racism. Uh, yeah, he says... Uh, that strikes um, me as interesting at that time. That's um, people who try to divide Turkey. Mm -hmm. You know you have in Turkey one paragraph, the 216 forbids mm -hmm. to spread hatred among the people of Turkey, but unfortunately, this is not used to repress anti-Semitic or fascist or racist publications, but if you write about them, if you write Kurdish children in the Istanbul region have less chances at school, you can be sure you will get, you will get sued for 216. Because there are no Kurdish, Kurdish children. Yeah. So that's the point. Right. And that's, so, mm. I guess, and, and in the books of Harun Yahya, which is an independent, but full-time and 100% understand, I saw a short book, there I found, for example, the shooting of the 1st May 1977, which was the Turkish counterinsurgency forces, and it was a huge um, first <coughs> demonstration of the trade union, and they shoot in that, to, mm -hmm. and it was presented also as something to spread racism among the Turks, among the Turkish population, to divide mm -hmm. Turkey mm -hmm. by, I think this is the thought. So, but that means, so, Zionism is mm -hmm. spreading that, um, dividing is dividing Turkey. the Turkish nation. Yeah. I think this is a yeah. thought. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't write it. Josh? Yeah. Um, a very small question and then a larger question. A very small question has to do with your slide here. I assume you're talking about prosecution? Is that, is that a... Uh, a prosec I mean, a prosecution? What is that bullet meant to... I'm confused by that bullet. Um, the first one, hardly any persecution of anti -sense. Persecution of that isn't... A, Maybe prosecution. I prosecution, yes, yeah, sorry for you my English. Le you mean legal, <laughs> legal process? Yeah, sorry. Okay. No, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure because that's interesting. <laughs> it's just a very different. No. Yeah, that's what I just thought. For example, Mein Kampf is yeah. not forbidden. It's forbidden because the German library in Bavaria, who held the main copy, forbid it to print it in Turkey without having the copyright. But in Turkey, it's not forbidden. Mm -hmm. And. For example, the Jewish community tried in 93, when we had a liberal, nationalist, not Islamist government, to forbid the paper of Harun Yahya. I, I showed you these books, these horrible books. And in 95, he was acquitted. Prosecution, sorry. Thank you. So the larger question, um, I, I'm just interested in, in um, legal processes, so that's why I wanted to make sure that's what you meant. Um, you began your talk by discussing the um, conflagration, the outbreak of, of anti-Semitism in Turkey um, during the Gaza War. And you suggested that um, it appeared to diminish following the end of the Gaza War, at least the, the most obvious manifestations. Mm -hmm. And then most of your talk, you explained the what I would describe as the social and historical conditions mm -hmm. over many decades mm -hmm. that um, predispose the population towards anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. But you didn't explicitly reconnect that long um, discussion back to the original um, opening about Gaza. And so I'm just curious. I, I can imagine how you would explain it, but I'd like to hear in your own words how, how you connect those. Is it just that the Gaza, for example, one explanation is the outbreak of the Gaza war serves as a pretext to um, vent hostility against Jews that's already embedded in the 
as a result of these social and historical conditions. That would be one example, but I assume there are other, you would probably have a different way of explaining it. No, I, I, actually I said I try not to discuss that because the discussion of the Palestine conflict mm -hmm. is not a question of Turkey. It's a question we have in all the countries. You had demonstrations in Germany, in France, whatever. So sure, but it was, it, how um, would you explain it in, in Turkey or in any country in Europe then? Yeah, but this, um, that's such a huge topic. And um, I agree with it. I'm just <laughs> no. It's it's of course it's part of the strains of anti-Semitism in Turkey. Mm -hmm. It is linked to first of all Islamist, nationalist, and left-wing people always have seen the Palestinian as our brothers for different reasons. Mm -hmm. The left-wing considered them as one of the worldwide. Uh, liberation movements, like the left-wing people all over the world. Mm -hmm. The Islamists saw them as our brother in faith. Mm -hmm. And the nationalists say, this has been our land, and now it's taken by Israel. And this recent outbreak, so it was not the first time during the uh, Lebanon war, sure. there were huge demonstrations, but yeah. now it's also I told you that the Islamist party split into parties, mm -hmm. and there is a Islamist, a fascist party which has very Islamist uses as Islamist. I, I try to avoid to give you all these complicated party names who, who are under, uh, very often forbidden and then re-emerge because that would be. But Erdogan, in a way, is under pressure because the more Islamist groups. The Saudi party see, use this, and we have an electoral campaign. So when he came back from Davos, everybody said that was good, but we know he won't go on. He has to cancel the contacts with Israel. He has to, con to cancel the alliance with Israel. But if these parties would be on power, they wouldn't do. It. So that's the other. That's the flip side. Yeah, just as a point, I was in Israel when this thing happened between him and uh, Shimon yeah. Peres, and it was major, major news in Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really something that I've never even seen in my years living in Israel. The news really it was like twenty for twenty four hours. It was this exchange was really covered. Yeah, but, but there were a lot of reasons. Erdogan was trying to negotiate with the Hamas, and he didn't know that this attack would. Mm -hmm. and so he found. That's possible that he really felt betrayed, betrayed by why did you send me to make these negotiations and don't tell me that you are going to attack them. And he was, and he's known for a person who loses his temper. So I don't even think what that he, it was a theater. Maybe it was a theater just two weeks, uh, three weeks prior to the elections, but and he won enormous prestige among all. Can I just add one? Sorry, one last bit to that question. So this is part of the explanation of why um, anti-Semitism seems so obviously inflamed at the moment of the Gaza mm -hmm. War. Then how do you explain why it seemed to so quickly go away in its most outward manifestation? Do you read Turkish newspapers? Every day? No. No, so I, I don't. don't. Know, yeah. No, I'm just saying, based on your, uh, I said your presentation, it, 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 it seemed skip from the headlines. It's because we had an electoral campaign. That's what I'm asking. What, yeah, what no, happened no. after? I think the... Um, you suggested that the, the outward manifestations went yeah. away. What happened afterwards? That's what I'm asking. I don't, I don't, I don't know because I don't live in Turkey and I don't believe in Turkey. Yeah, first of all, I'm here since six months, so I just okay. follow the process of the papers. and. Mm -hmm. I try to, to, to focus on the everyday anti-Semitism. Because the discussion about Palestine is another discussion you have in other countries as well. So I try to, to, to lay out which different factors contributed to the everyday anti-Semitism in Turkey. Okay. Which is, let's give the background to be. So we have, we have a few more minutes, so I'm uh, not wants to ask a question. Is there anybody else who would like to ask a question? Okay. So, and that, and then you want to ask one quick one after? Yeah. 
I just a little bit, a little, and I okay, she has yeah. Oh, okay. um, so you're saying that you just you were thinking about every day anti-Semitism in Turkey and all mm -hmm. the big things. And so what I was wondering is what what do you think is, is unique or interesting or different about Turkey? Because as you were telling the story, I was thinking, well, this could be a story about I don't know Romania maybe or Poland or other Eastern European countries we study in the sense that anti-Semitism was maybe less implicated after the Holocaust in the sense that anti-Semitism is still an everyday language and it's still around and it's still, you can buy these anti-Semitic books and you can, you know, hear these, um, okay, I mean, Poland, it's less, less out there, but it's still there. You can still go to a bookstore, buy anti-Semitic books, you can get the pamphlets, you can hear about Jews running the world, you can hear about Jews running the media. I think it's the same. Right, very similar stories because uh, you know, I can tell you about Romania. So I'm asking, what's the? Because when you were telling this, it sounded like a very Euro almost very European story to me in in many ways. Yeah, when I started in Bloomington, I started with the fact that um, the same present or similar presentation that it's interesting in the London reports on anti-Semitism, Turkey is mentioned among the European countries. And the Stephen Roth Institute in Tel Aviv puts Turkey among the Middle East countries. Because it's and a question. Yeah. It has parts of both. Yeah, yeah. So, and for example, I have a slide I didn't show you. There you have um, Donald Tusk with the David right. Star on his, uh, to blame him to be a puppet of the. Yeah, absolutely. And you have the same thing, Erdogan now. He's presented by the more right wing people to be. Um, um, yeah. That's one of the reasons, actually, maybe my point is that I try to counter this Islamist history. In the United States press, oh, it's, it's gone again, responses to anti-Semitism. In Turkey, it's denied. And in the United States, they say, yeah, these are the Islamists. And they don't understand that there are so many layers. This is not specific Turkey, but what is specific Turkey that the Western country always say, yeah, that's Islamist. Mm -hmm. That's maybe the point, so. Yeah. You know, it seems to me that the phenomenon you're talking about is an amazingly com complex one. Mm -hmm. And the danger, I think, that we all face is what Jacob Burkhardt called uh, the, uh, s the simple stories. Stories that take something that is so complicated, including the fact that Turkey is both European and Mideast, mm -hmm. and just focusing on one thing as if that was the explanation of what occurred. And that's what I meant also by the Durban example, that these are very complicated happenings. And the studies of any one of them, as you've just showed us, mm -hmm. is extraordinarily complex. So I was curious if Turkey provides the kind of academic freedom that permits people to talk about this without uh, uh, fear, and if, or if people who do make such public presentations, uh, both there or elsewhere, need to worry about uh, protection as human rights defenders. Um, there are people in Turkey who publish about it. For example, Rifa Bali, he wrote several books on it, and in some press you have it. I, the picture actually would disappear. For the first time, people of the human rights organization made a, um, sued these, I showed you the picture of Dark Zanadalao, Dark Zanadalao Duzna, and they sued them. It's the first time that a civil rights organization makes such a statement, but actually it's a small group of people. In Turkish we have a saying, we are 40 people, we know each other. So these people are also involved in debates on other question. Um, there is a lack on serious studies on anti-Semitism, but during the last years in the left and liberal intellectuals, for example, the um, review Biriki, which is one of the intellectual um, on political science, it's a monthly review, and they had two, um, how do you say that? two issues with the main topic on anti-Semitism. And I think it would be wonderful, for example, to organize a conference with them together, to, 
not to talk about anti-Semitism in Turkey, but to talk with people in Turkey, even with people who are, in a way, weak for some, um, who are not conscious, who don't know what they say. In, sorry for <laughs> blaming them, but it has never been debated. Good point to end. So we have, we have to leave the room. Oh. And I want to, uh, two things, just two quick announcements. First, first announcement, thank you very much for coming and presenting a wonderful presentation. <laughs> and I also want to thank Annette for helping put all this together. Thank you before, so thank you. And if anybody wants to join us, I hope it's okay with you, because maybe we can all go for lunch and continue the conversation. If people want to join us. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for your patience and the questions, yeah. Oh, it's prosecution. Prosecution. I mean, PRO. <laughs> but it's, uh, uh, um, it's so the wrong connotation. And the word in German can mean the legal verfolgung uh, of the crime or um, the persecution of people. Uh, so far, So we'll leave from the center? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to slip down. Charles, are we going to slip down? Yeah. Yeah.